Guten Tag and good morning in the U.S. My name is Doug McClure. I'm an energy and environmental attorney based in the state of Oregon here in the U.S. And my job today will be to help moderate with my colleague uh, there on the German side the presentations uh, that will launch this first series uh, in our effort addressing critical environmental issues with area-wide planning. And uh, before I begin, I just want to say it's a privilege to uh, be a part of this effort. Uh, my work with the U.S.-German bilateral started nearly 30 years ago. Um, and you'll hear from our work paper that we are developing under the UN Sustainable Development Guidelines as a as a as a model and a guide. Uh, that effort began under a UN framework for cooperation uh, with Germany and has produced uh, significant documents as well as uh, collaboration and exchanges in the revitalization of industrial and contaminated lands and brownfields. Um, now, before I introduce the speakers today, I want to say a few things about what area-wide planning is from the perspective of the position paper that we've hammered out over the last six months to a year, actually more like a year, um, and, uh, and just leave you with a few thoughts on that so when you listen to the presentations, you can understand perhaps the differences between what many of you are familiar with uh, or may be familiar with with respect to regional planning. Um, and uh, there are sites that you're going to hear about today that cover more than just one facility or one area, but do have a, a regional impact. But unlike regional planning, the concept of area-wide planning, first of all, as I mentioned, uh, is rooted in the UN Sustainability Development Goals for the context of the European Union. Uh, goal 11, for uh, which basically says to make cities and human settlements um, the uh, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And goal 15, which simply says to help support life on land. Now, the, I, I would refer people to, if they wanna learn more about how these goals are understood, uh, the EU Eurostat uh, uh, web has significant data uh, based on research for how these goals have been implemented and, and, and what information has been collected in terms of how they've been uh, interpreted and, and the, the progress toward meeting them. Um, and I think that's the, that's very helpful in, in understanding where we're coming from for describing area-wide planning. Um, again, unlike uh, regional planning, part of the focus here is to take the economic, social, and environmental factors into consideration whether it's one site or sites across many miles or kilometers in a particular region and make those a central part of the planning process for revitalization. I will read one uh, note from our, our position paper, uh, which states that area-wide planning can link ecological functions across administrative borders to create resiliency and robust ecosystems. The reason I, I want to read that is that unlike regional planning, it is not limited to geographic or political boundaries. And again, it can be effective on a one facility, one industrial or military site or coal mining area, as you were gonna hear about in our presentations later today, or it can be effective across uh, a much larger area 
and looks to bring the communities affected by those sites, both the benefits historically provided, as well as what needs to happen in the short term and the long term uh, to bring the planning process to bear on revitalization. One other critical element in the Arrowhead planning concept is to look at the ecological functions that exist or may have existed in the area impacted by these sites that need to be restored. Um, and also take into account the differences and the connections between urban and rural communities that have an impact on what is on the ground now, what needs to happen in the short term and what needs to happen in the long term. Now, in, in my experience as a land use lawyer over the last 35 years, I have learned certain things and I've been a beneficiary of the fact that Oregon in the United States is somewhat unique, not only in the United States, but in the world in terms of its planning approach. Back in the 1970s, it mandated what many could refer to as area-wide planning. Um, and there are certain lessons that come from that. And I will, I will leave you with a few thoughts as you listen to the presentation to think about whether these lead to questions or to ideas on the potential success of these efforts. One is that the area-wide plan concept needs clear authority. It, it requires clear communication. It requires thorough research and good data and it requires a fair and transparent process that is focused on information from the directly impacted communities. But of course, based on resources that are needed to implement real solutions, it's going to need to reach wider than uh, local communities that may not have the, the, the necessary resources to revitalize and bring new economic, social, and environmental improvement to these areas. So with that, I will uh, turn now to introducing the, uh, the speakers, and I'm not going to read their biographical data, but I will tell you that uh, starting with my colleagues in Germany and Thuringia, uh, Ingo Kwas and Kirsten Roselt, I've had the honor and, and privilege of working with in the past um, as a part of the U.S. German bilateral. Uh, we were able to collaborate on a project in uh, in my home area in Oregon um, that actually incorporated some of the area wide and regional planning that had gone on before for a, a former industrial site and they brought some wonderful, and I would say German and European thinking to uh, raise the excitement level about what could happen on some of these areas, reconnecting the, the city to the resources in the area, like the, the natural areas. Um, uh, and uh, I will let them describe where they work and who they are. I've also had the privilege of getting to know John Groshan with the United States Environmental Protection Agency, which of course has been a founding member along with Germany and its equivalent uh, for the bilateral and now DEUS. Um, and John will describe his work with communities affected by decades and sometimes longer of, of coal mining and energy production and one of the links between these two uh, presentations that you're going to hear from our German colleagues and the and John is the energy connection, transportation connection that impacts uh, what might be a, a possible in terms of the impact to climate and uh, our ability to improve on the local ground, case by case, site by site, uh, our approach to climate change and climate action. 
And so well, I'm very excited to, to hear both of those presentations. Um, and I will turn it back uh, to you uh, to get started. Oh, and by the way, uh, it's up to you, Ingo and Kirsten, whether you want to go first or John, you want to go first. So I'll, uh, if we're ready for the presentations, Kirsten, why don't we, uh, why don't we turn to you? So I think we will start. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. So. Now you can see the presentation. Is it so? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, my name is Ingo Lars. I'm a freelance architect of urban design. Uh, I have an office of my own. It's called Bar Stadtmann and can see it here. And uh, I'm sitting in Weimar. And uh, we are a team of eight. Uh, town planners, uh, architects, landscape architects, and geographics. Uh, Kirsten, do you want to say something about your person? Okay. okay, my name is Kirsten Roselt. I have a diploma in geology. Since 19, 1990, I worked as environmental consultant at the Jena Geos engineering office and uh, in uh, 2021, I became the managing director. I am participating in consulting of over 2,000 brownfields in Germany, East Europe, and one time in the United States stack. And in 2005, I received a doctorate on the topic of the rehabilitation of the world's largest cadmium contaminated site in the middle of a spa. Since about uh, 20, then I devote myself increasingly to questions of the energetic city rebuilding from the perspectives of renewable energy potentials and ecology. With Ingo, my company is connected in a cooperative. That's, that's all. Okay, so what we have prepared, uh, there are four points. And first, I will give you an short introduction in the system of spatial planning in Germany. And then Kirsten will present uh, two projects in, in Arnstadt and in Jena. And later he will give us a summary or some conclusions about these projects. Uh, the system of spatial planning in Germany, I will, the, the introduction, I will use the example of the state of Thuringia, the city of Jena. Um, uh, the spatial planning in Germany, there are four levels which are connected in a countercurrent principle. So they are an interdependence, interdependence with each other. So that means planning is not only practiced top down, but also with a feedback bottom up. There is an intensive participation from all layers of the different stakeholders. You see the field on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, it's a field, the professional uh, subject specific reinforcement through specific technical sectoral planning, such as specific assessments and reports regarding traffic, environment, climate protection, or contamination, and at last, also the reuse of uh, brown fields. But step by step. Um, another important aspect in the planning system in Germany is that, uh, in addition to the formal planning system, I show you there is a, also a, a, a wide field of informal planning with self commitment, especially uh, in local planning. Examples are integrated concepts of, for urban development. That's a field where I'm. Uh, uh, most projects are, and uh, this urban development which function as a basic for binding land use plans and furthermore as an interface for the planning of smaller local areas or concrete actions and measures. That is the only one I want to say to this. But back to the system of spatial planning in Germany, at first level is the 
spatial planning from the whole area of the Federal Republic of Germany with principles and visions. And uh, here are formulating a balance in the general principles and measures for spatial planning. For instance, the National Sustainable Development Strategy, which is of a special relevancy for our topic today, is the so-called 30 hectare target meaning to reduce the daily increase of settlement and transport areas to 30 hectares. Right now, we are still have a long way to go. In 2018, the daily increase was 56 hectares, for example. And another um, task is ongoing observation of spatial developments, which are summarized in such reports you see on the right-hand side as a foundation for our daily work. The next level is the planning at the state level. Uh, the state development program of Thuringia was passed in 2014. It contains the general principles and measures of special planning for the whole state regarding not only planning of infrastructure, cities and towns, but also the cultural landscapes, landscape in all his facets. The Free State Thuringia is located in the middle of Germany. The big cities like Berlin and Munich can be reached in two hours by train, by ICE, for example. Thuringia covers 16,171 square kilometers. That means 6,244 square miles. In comparison with the United States, it compares uh, to the sites of Connecticut. It has a population about 2.1 million uh, inhabitants, whereas in Connecticut has a population of 3.6 million, for example. Uh, Thuringia is a state of small towns. The most inhabitants um, live in small and medium-sized towns. It's mainly characterized by rural areas. The capital airport with a little over 200,000 inhabitants here in the middle of the map. And Jena is the second largest city with over 110,000 inhabitants here, um, along the chain of cities along the motorway number four. And there are the example cities, Arnstadt and Jena, we will see later. And the second level is the level on the regional planning. On the regional level, the aim is to implement the nation and statewide principles of planning in a direct dialogue with the local authorities. Thuringia is split in four planning regions. You see here on the left hand side, the middle, southwest, north, and east. This is example east with uh, Jena. Uh, and uh, there are different plans, including this regional planning, for example, deal with the uh, spatial use map with different aspects like agricultural land use, like free space protections here in green, like fluid protect, fluid flood protection here in blue along the river Saale and also the settlement areas. But if you want to know what happened inside these settlement areas, you have went to the next level and that is the level of cities and municipalities. That's the land use planning. Here is the example from the city of Jena from 2005. Uh, the land use plan of, the, of this level uh, shows the different types of land uses for the whole city. Uh, for example, residential areas here in red or mixed use areas in brown or uh, commercial building areas in, in gray or gardening areas and, and so on, nature reserves, or, but also contaminations and all these aspects of urban development. The planning timeline is set to a period of 10 up to 15 years. You see 2005, now we are involved in the update of the land use plan of Jena, actually we are dealing with. Um, yeah, the, the two examples we will show you later is uh, the Friedensberg Terrassen and later will Carsten um, speak about the size area in this region here. <clears throat> But I told you already uh, the, the field of informal uh, planning instruments and there's, for example, uh, uh, the integrated neighborhood development. Here's a concept in Jena West we uh, deal with in 2015. 
and the aim is to develop a spatial planning principle which then acts as a basic found, as a foundation for the land use plan and other planning and the, to derive concrete measures and projects from these principles. For example, also for the size area, you do you see, for example, the number, the number six to have uh, later other planning and uh, the, at last the, the project which Carsten show us. Uh, there are also other um, uh, informal planning unnecessary, for, for example, the Wohnbauflächen Konzeption or also a concept for the development of the garden areas in Jena, which we deal with in 2013. The uh, informal planning is, uh, is a perfect op opportunity to do public, public partic participation opposed uh, to during the formal planning process. So we do here, for example, in uh, Jena, with the stake in the Jena West and Centrum. And now we are arrived at the level of uh, uh, architecture and uh, urban design from big to small. Here we are on the uh, level of the binding land use planning uh, that is the project Friedensberg Terrassen in Jena. The building owner is the Communal, Communal Building Association Jena Wohnen. And this is an example for one of the national planning, planning principles, inner development before outer development. We use the wasteland here and using the potential of inner cities, of inner city areas. That is an example for it. And you know, it's maybe it's the same in the United States. Uh, this is the urban design and the architectural and the landscape design from Jung and Reich architect in Weimar and Stock Landschaftsarchitekt in Jena, who have won the first prize in the art architectural competition. But in order to realize it, a binding land use plan is necessary. And so we come in the, on the field. This is the binding land use plan for the residential area. Friedensberg Terrassen, it is necessary to realize the project. And today it looks so it's uh, realized here in Jena. And uh, <clears throat> the project won the German owner award in 2018 and also the award for Turing architecture and urban design with a special mention to the aspect of the accessibility. Yes, that was the short, very short introduction in the system of spatial planning in uh, Germany. And now Kerstin will start his report about the Arnstadt studies. Thank you, Ingo, dear colleagues. Uh, together with students from the University of Applied Sciences in Erfurt, we have developed a study to find out what effects the installation of renewable energies can have in the remediation of contaminated sites. We used a former gas plant in the city of Arnstadt as, as an exemplary site. There was deep contamination with polycyclic aromatics, cyanides, and heavy metals. The remediation provided for excavation within three excavation pits. The aim was to use the site for residential development. In the figure, you can see the planned residential buildings in synopsis with the excavation pits. Next, please. We examined three cases. The first scenario is a standard solution. This means that renewable energy installations should only take place after the remediation of the contaminated sites. This includes photovoltaics on the roofs and geothermal collectors, which are installed next to the three houses with heat pumps afterwards and with their own excavation. Next, please. Uh, this time, the ground collector will not be installed subsequently, but will be integrated during backfilling of the excavation pits, same area. The savings from the excavation cover 8% of the cost for photovoltaic systems on all houses and the heat pump system of the three houses. All other conditions remain the same as in scenario one. And uh, the next picture, please, shows us a scenario three combined solution with synergy effects. 
the ground connector is installed as in scenario two. Instead of photovoltaic, photovoltaic thermal systems are installed, which generate heat as well as electricity. In addition, a carport and an earth wall built from rehabilitation material will be equipped with photovoltaic thermal systems. This will allow 100% of the energy demand for the neighborhood to be met on balance, but storage will be required due to weather dependency. Uh, lithium ion storage for electricity and underground gravel water storage for heat. Please, the next. You can study the cost evaluation in detail later on the basics of this list. Varium 3 with the highest investment costs, but also the best sustainability is to be favored. With this variant, the complete coverage of the energetic demand is possible and after the amortization of 13 years, there are no more costs for energy except for the maintenance of the plants. The next piece, the, yes, the conclusions, the remediation of contaminated sites and the construction of alternative energy technologies have structural synergies. Case study shows uh, self-sufficient supply with 13 years amortization. After that, the energy costs almost nothing except maintenance. The largest structural overlap exists between geothermal and solar energy. Cost reduction arises primarily through the use of synergies in earthworks. An extrapolation to all locations of contaminated sites in Germany show us um, 11,400 terajoule head potential in contaminated site, 8,000 terajoule through thermal underground storage. Um, a little bit of, of uh, thermal energy consumption is, is able and um, 1, minute, 1 million tons uh, carbon dioxide reduction is possible. The results on the on the next picture, please. The installation of alternative energy technologies in the context of the remediation of contaminated sites is a win-win situation. Technical convention interventions for decontamination and revitalization of former industrial sites provide potential for the time-saving and cost-reducing installation of facilities generation and storing alternative energies. After an intervention, the former industrial site is ideally decontaminated and simultaneously energetically upgraded. The eliminated deposition and supplementary creation of added value gives a new impulse to the preparation of brownfields by decreasing investment costs from contaminated sites and reducing general financial inhibitions threshold. Contaminated sites and renewable energies have in common that they are always a land use issue. Uh, please, uh, the next. Ah, yes, most of the renewable energies have a large land consumption, so it is important to look for optimization potentials. The optimal solution is multiple use, for example, as a production site that generates energy on the same space. The next. This picture, this picture illustrates uh, red, oh, it's a difficult word, <laughs> redundancies and optimization possibilities between remediation and energetic use of the site from a technical point of view. Finally, please show the, show the next uh, picture, please. Finally, we would like to show you the typical story of an uh, old German company. The remediation of contaminated sites and the use of renewable energies play a major role in the development of a sustainable site. Next, please. 18, oh, 1884, it's a mistake. 1884, Otto Schott, Ernst Upper, and Carl Zeiss established the Schott and Associated 
last technical laboratory here in Jena. The Glassworks become a foundation owned enterprise. Its sole owner is the Carl Zeiss Stiftung. The production of optical glass, especially for lenses, microscopes, and binoculars, later photo apparatus, quickly had a great demand and the factory grew rapidly. In 19 um, in 19, all, already half of the business volume is in export. All factory buildings were built of brick. Next, please. The site had another extensive enlargement in the first half of the 20th century. In the Third Reich, optical glass became important for the armaments industry. A new generation of bricks and concrete was used for the new buildings. Next, please. After World War II in 1945, the entire management and many experts went from the Soviet zone to West Germany. The original factory in Jena, Soviet zone of occupation, GDR as of 1949, is expropriated and converted into a national owned enterprise. Numerous new buildings were built of reinforced concrete. In 1952, the foundation enterprise is rebuilt in Mainz, Federal Republic of Germany, under the direction of Erich Schott, the son of the company's founder. After the fall of the wall in 1991, Schott Mainz incorporates Schott Jena after the German reunification. The site in Jena is renovated and reorganized. Next, please. In addition, in addition to commercial glass and ceramic cooktops, Schott's production spectrum, spectrum increasingly included photovoltaic panels and display glass for smartphones. In 2018, Thais buys 80,000 uh, square meter from Schott. It was the historical core of the company. Next, please. Thais' intention is to build a new high-tech site on the contaminated site. 400 million euros will be invested in this. The demolition alone took over here. Next. Then it went deep into the ground to generate a level surface for the foundation on the slope. In the process, vast quantities of contaminated soil had to be disposed of. In addition to heavy metals, most of the contamination came from the production of gas for heating the glass tubes. The gas production resulted in deep contamination with polycyclic aromatic hydrogens, among others. Next. Today, the bottom is almost reached. We hope that foundation work can begin in May. By then, 800,000 tons of demolition material and soil will have been disposed of from the site. In the area of the construction pit edge, the supporting columns reach a height of up to two uh, of 20 meters. The next piece. And this is what it will look like. A modern high tech center with green rooms for production with co-working spaces and with a concert hall. Here too, we are using the excavation pit for the construction of a geothermal, geothermal plant the building is also being constructed according to the most modern energy aspects. And next to it, Schott is building a new production site for the world's best display classes. In the way, Zeiss and also Schott are living up to their historical role and responsibility. The next. New opportunities for brownfields arise from society society's overall responsibility in terms of climate adaptation and adaptation and urban redevelopment and vice versa. Potentially, the topic is an integral part of innovative land management for the development of sustainable, resilient and energy efficient commercial areas and settlement areas for the future. From this point of view, climate protection and the move away from fossil energy imports 
are becoming a new driver for the revitalization of brownfield sites. The next, we are learning to see fallow lands as an opportunity. We thus support the supply of an area partial self-sufficiency of regions or city districts. How to develop an energy-related urban redevelopment? Brownfields become areas for production, energy conversion, and, so and storage. Brownfields become potential components of cities' climate adaptation strategies. Upgrading through the energy potential of a site helps against ecological devaluation caused by contaminated sites. Wow. In goes the next piece. Thank you very much uh, from Ingo and me. And I would show you two pictures. Uh, hurry, hurry, see you in Dubai, our uh, model of a um, uh, smart neighborhood uh, you can see at the Campus Germany in Dubai till March 31. And the last, the last uh, come to us to Jena in June. Uh, to the conference, our future in the neighborhood, developing existing neighborhoods sustainably and systemically. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you, Ingo. Um, one thing I did notice in the presentation was uh, along the bottom, you mentioned your uh, Opterisk. Uh, analysis tool that you have developed, which we applied here in the United States to determine uh, the intersection between the most economical remediation and the most appropriate level of risk for a heavily contaminated site. It was absolutely fascinating, something that had never been done uh, on a site here in the state of Oregon. I, I want to thank uh, Ingo Kwas from Quastat and uh, Kirsten Roselt from Vienna Geos. Um, and we will probably take questions at the end of the next presentation. I think that's probably the best way to move us through uh, uh, both of the presentations. Um, so if you have specific questions for Kirsten or Ingo, uh, Mark them down, and we will turn now to John Groshan with the environmental, the, the US Environmental Protection Agency, um, who is a senior policy uh, official there in Washington, DC, and has done a lot of work in the energy space uh, and has a fascinating presentation on uh, a very huge challenge that we face in the United States on our transition from uh, coal fossil fuels to a new economy. John, take it away. Thank you for that introduction. And it's good to have this discussion between the United States and Germany on these topics. I feel like there is so much to discuss between the uh, shared experiences of where we're doing transitions in the local scale, at the state scale, at the national scale. I'm going to talk a little bit about some local issues, but I wanted to start with our kind of national context of energy transition here in the United States. Uh, as Doug said, my name is John Grosshans with the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm a city planner by trade, and I work as a senior advisor in the administrator's office, and I really deal with distressed cities and properties and places that need assistance in some form of transition. Uh, in the past, I've worked with the uh, city of Detroit during its bankruptcy as it transitioned uh, as a municipality in the United States. I've worked with a lot of individual uh, sites, uh, automotive sites or other industry sites in the Midwest and looking forward to this discussion on energy transition. When we talk about energy transition, a lot of questions come up, why now? Uh, why is energy transition and, and planning connected at this point in time? And there are a number of trends that are making this uh, pertinent right now to the discussion uh, in multiple places in, our, in the United States as well as around the world. And so what we're seeing in the United States is a trend of coal-fired power plants that are retiring. And we're seeing a lot of these plants 
have been slated for retirement. There's a plan, uh, decommissioning, and we're seeing that process accelerate. So here's a little bit of data that shows what we're seeing on the United States side with our energy generation. But what we're also seeing is we're seeing a lot of headlines in the news. We're seeing in local communities what this means beyond just data. And it means quite a bit. It means jobs. It means there's sites that are uh, in need of some sort of uh, cleanup and redevelopment. It means there's a lot of potential ripples or impacts to that local host community. And it's something that uh, really a lot of communities don't understand until they're going through it for the first time. Uh, so um, here's some headlines. These happen to be from Michigan. Uh, and it really illustrates that a lot of the uh, power generation in our country, uh, the trends are, are not only there, but they're accelerated in some cases. Uh, communities or utilities that thought they had uh, 10, 20 years to think about this now find out that they're on a shorter path to some sort of energy transition. And that's the reason why in the United States, there's been a recent uh, new administration initiative focused on revitalizing energy communities. And this is an interagency working group that's led by uh, the White House and the federal agencies and departments to really focus on coal and power plant communities and really think about what are the resources that are needed by these local communities, uh, including planning resources, technical assistance resources to do this transformation and to be uh, equitable and just about how these resources can get to the communities that are most in need. I dropped into the chat a link to the website that shows a lot of the, the background on this topic in the United States and has a lot more information. Uh, I saw there's a number of communities that are participants today. Uh, if you have questions, if you want to look at resources, um, the website has more information on that topic. By and large, this initiative is focusing on people. It's focusing on the workers that are part of the power plant or part of the coal mining or part of the mineral extraction industry and looking at what happens to them as workers, what happens to the local community that hosted that mine or that power plant, and how do we connect them to resources that are needed for this revitalization? Oftentimes those resources are uh, things we know are useful. It's infrastructure dollars, it's uh, cleanup, environmental remediation. Uh, we just saw the examples from the, the previous presentation about how the, the cleanup was instrumental in getting that site redeveloped. Um, it's also new jobs and it's new skill training for the workers that were part of these industries. Just a little bit of the landscape in the United States. Uh, this isn't an issue that's that's spread all over. This is an issue that is uh, focused in certain places. And I'm gonna focus a little bit on Appalachia and some of the issues that are uh, really magnified in the, the Eastern part of the United States where we have a number of uh, long time distressed communities now adapting to this new shift in energy where they're seeing what happens when a coal mine closes or a power plant closes and how that site can be uh, potentially redeveloped, but also how that community at large can really find its way um, to new um, forms of economic development and employment and uh, revitalization. So just to dive in a little bit with some maps, as a city planner, I can't help but show a couple of maps here to everyone. Um, so Appalachia in the United States is largely the, the eastern part of the the Appalachian Mountains, and it's not just one state, it's encompassing parts of several states, which is part of the challenge, frankly, of tackling this issue. It's uh, something that uh, isn't necessarily in a specific uh, one geography, but spans many geographies. Uh, a lot of people have images of, of these pictures when we think about this region. Uh, and these pictures are, are older historic photos, um, but some of the challenges and some of the context is still relevant. Uh, focused on underground mining, communities that grew up at the mouth of the mine that were focused on mining in the mineral industry. And so you see a really strong relationship between mines and communities um, in these places. The other thing that's connected is the, the level of distress. In some places has not changed significantly. And when you overlay this energy transition on top of uh, existing conditions, you can see that a lot of these places that have struggled will continue to struggle if there's not a change or additional resources that are brought to the table. 
The other thing I'll, I'll mention is that a lot of these places haven't need haven't had a need to do transition in the past. So they are really thinking about this for the first time. I've worked with a lot of automotive manufacturing communities and whether it's an automotive site, whether it is a uh, power plant, whether it's a mine, for most people that has existed for generations. Many years of mining means that people haven't thought about what happens when the mine closes. This is the first time. And so it's natural that there's gonna be a little bit of uh, difficulty in getting started. And so people have to think about what's needed and what's new. And eventually we wanna to get to where we can find those resources and how we can access those resources. But in many of these communities, that first couple of steps are very difficult to, to walk through to actually get to the point where you can talk about resources. So there's a lot of uh, money available through the new infrastructure uh, bill that is out, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that's part of the United States uh, funding right now for energy communities. And even though there's a lot of money out there, the challenge is how do you connect that funding to that local community that has been impacted or will be impacted by a closing power plants or a change in their economy. Many times we start with the conversation. This is a picture from last week. Uh, this is a picture from West Virginia where we had a round table and sat down to talk about where the federal government resources could meet the needs of local communities in West Virginia. This is the conversation that has to happen. It's that connection between resources and local needs. And it doesn't stop at the table. It has to really go right into the planning portion uh, because that's, I think, where we actually see results. Conversations are great, uh, but when you have actual plans and you have actual strategies, that leads to shovels in the ground and that leads to changes people can point to and see in their own community. So there's a lot of steps to what we hope to do with this work uh, between different levels of government, also with the utility itself and with a lot of the local communities. I'm not gonna go through all these uh, steps here, but a lot of communities find themselves struggling with how do they prepare for this transition. And this is where that whole integrated approach is helpful. Uh, it's an energy discussion. It's a land use discussion. Certainly there's implications for what happens with the environment and the remediation of these properties, but it's also a social dimension and it's a workforce uh, discussion as well. Without having this robust discussion and these sets of issues on the table, it's really hard to figure out what happens next for a lot of these communities. Just to focus a little bit on brownfields and what happens with environmental contamination remediation, a lot of these same questions that are swirling with a, with a power plant are the same for really any brownfield site where we've had past contamination, uh, past in, environmental uh, or industrial legacy on that site. You wanna know what the status is. You're trying to figure out how can this site be reused from the market uh, perspective what does the community want to see on this particular site? Oftentimes uh, you see local plans and how those relate to these individual sites. And that's really helpful. So when we talk about integrated planning, uh, the previous presentation showed a couple of examples where you had uh, local commitments to do plans that worked hand in hand with other plans or with changes in the economy, like the closure of a plant. All of this has to be done in the context of the local community and conversations with where they want to see these particular projects go now. Just a couple of examples of um, where this has happened locally. Uh, here's an example from uh, Michigan. This was a power station that was right in the middle of the downtown. It was on the waterfront. The, the site plan looks very similar to the site plan we just looked at in the previous presentation where it's in a good location, but the property itself was a, a former power station. It's hard to redevelop. It's hard to think about what you do with all that space in a large building like this and to reuse that space. At the same time, you are also remediating the contamination that's been on a property uh, that's been used for a long time as an industrial use. Uh, at the end of the day, the picture on the right shows that the site has been redeveloped as an office building. This is now an insurance headquarters for uh, frankly, high paying jobs. And it's a, a success story that we'd all love to see with many power stations and uh, industrial uses. 
They rebuilt part of the waterfronts to make this more of an amenity. And they actually built some of this around the remediation needs along that waterfront space, knowing they had to take out soil, they had to remove some of the contamination. And so they made that part of their redevelopment plan. That's a success story. Not every power station is going to be that beautiful when it finishes. And it's not going to be that easy because they're not always located in a downtown in a prime location for redevelopment. Um, oftentimes it takes a little bit of, of planning and strategy to make that happen. Uh, here's another example from Michigan. Uh, this is in the area outside of Detroit where they have a power station and the power station is on the river and it's located next to other industry. And the challenge was thinking of how this power station redevelopment can work with the sites that are nearby and can really not just be a single site, but could be part of the larger waterfront vision, part of the larger community vision. There's other plans that are made that talk about what the community would like to see, what the waterfront can look like, and that one site can be part of that bigger picture. When we talk about power plants, we often talk about power plants as, as the center, but there's a broader brownfield and community um, approach that can be useful. And this is really where the area-wide planning approach is helpful. Just dealing with the power plant is not going to be effective in giving that transition that the community needs. And oftentimes dealing with the power plant is one of the harder parts of the project. They're big, they don't move very quickly. And so having a broader perspective can be helpful to identify what other parts of the, the community or the project site might move a little faster or it could be part of that uh, redevelopment uh, in a way that could spark some new life uh, as part of that power plant uh, footprint itself. A lot of other communities have thought about this from an area-wide planning perspective. Here are some examples from Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania is part of that Appalachian belt uh, in the Eastern United States and they've had the same discussion there. What do you do not only with the, the site but how do you think of that site and the community? And they call it a playbook. And I, I love this idea of the playbook because it gets beyond planning and some of the words that we use as planners and really puts it into uh, the context of what do we have to do to get this to become a win for the community? Uh, the sale of the plant, the transition to some other use, um, just understanding there's a plan uh, in the future is really helpful. Um, so I, I like these examples from Pennsylvania. A lot of other communities and places are thinking similarly about how they can design a playbook, a plan, some future for these sites uh, as these plants are slated to be uh, decommissioned. I mentioned there's a, there's a larger set of resources in the United States that has just come online because of the infrastructure law that was passed recently. Brownfields has always been part of this conversation and there are resources available from the Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields program to help think through the planning, to help think through some of the early assessments that might be needed uh, to investigate the contamination, and then ultimately uh, some help on the cleanup side as well. So there's a lot of resources that have been here, and thankfully, thankfully were uh, increased with this new infrastructure law to get more support uh, to do more good work. I know folks are looking for more information on this topic. This is just a little bit. So uh, how to find out more, how to stay in touch on this. Uh, first of all, on the Brownfield side, we have our national conference coming up in person uh, in Oklahoma this year. So that'll be one place to go and learn more about where some of these success stories, where some of these resources can be applied and really have more discussions on this particular topic. Uh, there's also a number of Brownfield webinars and other activities that are available on the Brownfield websites. I think that uh, Anne dropped in some links in the chat if folks want to click on those resources to understand more about what the Brownfields program does. And then for the, the energy side, uh, I will say that to stay in touch on energy transition in the United States, we have a website. I dropped a link into the chat earlier up there. We have a newsletter that has resources. I saw a number of communities in the participant list on the side. And so if you are a community in the United States and you're thinking about how this transition can take place or where you can find resources, sign up for the newsletter to stay in the loop on what is available. There's a lot of money that's coming online just now because of the infrastructure law. And that's a great way to stay aware 
of where these resources might play a role in your own community, um, especially planning and technical assistance. There's not been a strong st a steady stream of funding for planning and technical assistance in the past. And it's nice to see that a lot of new programs are coming online that have technical assistance. They have planning, they have those meetings. They're gonna generate the maps and the discussions that we've seen in these presentations, hopefully in communities by you to help deal with some of the local needs that you're working with um, in your states and places. So I know we've got uh, discussion and questions planned, but I know that we also can't get, get to all this right now. Uh, so we've got a number of, of other events planned for the, um, the energy communities, and that's also available on our website through our virtual webinars. So if you have interest in further discussion on specific places, I'm happy to uh, talk through those as well. Thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of what's happening with this energy transition uh, in the United States and Appalachia in particular. Thank you, John, Ingo, and Kerstin. I'm Uwe Ferber from Stadtland Consulting Company in Leipzig. Starting the discussion in the next 30 minutes on the topic of integrated land use and planning. And as we decided to prepare our work and our position paper on integrated land, we lived in a different world because specifically in Germany, we are confronted to the impacts of the Ukrainian war and this impacts very largely on the land use. So we have conflicts because we want autonomy in the use of agriculture. We need the, the safety of agriculture food production, which makes it difficult to uh, use greenfield sites for ground for industry and development of land. We want to have energy autonomy, uh, which needs to uh, qualify land for solar panels, for hydrogen production, for with wind energy. So also lots of land use conflicts, specifically in coal mining areas where we have open cast coal mining. And uh, we want, on the other hand, also climate adaption. So we need green space in uh, land and we need housings. We have a lot of refugees since uh, several months and days in uh, several days in Germany. So see, the situation is a little bit really dramatic in Germany and due also to the density of settlements. Um, the, the uh, idea uh, to discuss is the integrated planning is not a self-runner. You, you, John, you have a, quite an optimistic playing view from the central government. It's the same in Germany. We have plenty of money, but we see also in the application and uh, that's the, the sectoral lobbyists for, let's say, road planning and different uh, lobbies are going on to do, do a lot of non-integrated planning work. This is also the case in the US and also to Ingo, is it easy to promote integrated planning beyond the all in different interests in sectorial lobbyship uh, from both sides? John, you could start. Thank you. Well, first, I'll just offer one one comment. Uh, when we're talking about energy transition, um, it is absolutely difficult to think about uh, changes that are taking place in in the in the global economics right now. That um, you have these plans or these ideas of what's going to happen, and then you find out that there are these uh, other challenges to deal with. With you mentioned land use conflicts, um, I feel like land use conflicts are going to be with us for some time, um, uh, even beyond other. Uh, types of discussions, because there's always that need to figure out, do we use this for energy? Do we use this for housing? Um, that is uh, almost a universal that will stay with us. And I think that speaks to the need for local planning and integrated planning to make sure that people can see that there are trade-offs and there are opportunities to do this development, um, especially if there are utility infrastructure coming offline or being potentially redeveloped offers an opportunity. And I think people need to see that opportunity that could come um, through the closure. It's not just the end, but it's actually maybe just a transition to something that's new. Uh, so that's why we see a lot of resources focused on what is the new use of that power plant or the new use of the mine uh, in a way that maybe wasn't always the same as it has been in the past. Um, in the last month or so, we've been talking a lot about money. Um, in part because we've not had a lot of money to spend on this particular topic. There's not been a lot of infrastructure. So I am, I am very rosy. I'm very excited about this particular topic uh, because it's new, uh, relatively new in the United States to have this type of uh, support for local communities that um, 
will help them hopefully transition in the future. So Ingo Kersten, it's the same in Germany. It's uh, easy to promote integrated planning and followed by the stakeholders, or is it still difficult to, to use this planning, planning and uh, participatory approach? In Germany, it was first a question of the financial support for the local authorities, because if you want to get the correct financial support from the Federal Republic of Germany or from the state of Thuringia, you have to have to use integrated instruments for analysis and, and contacts. And so it helped us uh, uh, to, to promote this integrated uh, uh, methods uh, because it's necessary if the uh, cities and uh, municipalities uh, like to to get uh, financial support from the from the from Germany or from the from the state of Thuringia and that's why it is so uh, both sides of a matter. <laughs> Okay, so another question in Germany, the discussion is very heavily on the idea to create an integrated planning multifunctionality. So using one site for different uses, is this maybe a one concept to promote and to get to a compromise between different conflicts and to promote integrated development as we understand under the idea of uh, the Leipzig Charta integrated urban development? Ingo, did you did you play on multifunctionality? I need support because my English is not the best. It's not the yet. Yeah, we give you we give you close, five yeah. seconds, John. You could reply first, but also I would enlarge the discussion on the auditorium and to, to, uh, to keep this discussion perhaps in a larger round. And so, if someone wants to start and to answer, he could please you would be all invited to. Come in the discussion now. I, I can start. Uh, in the United States, I think we are seeing more multifunctionality. There's a lot of uh, multiple uses that are planned on specific sites, especially large sites. When you have a large power plant footprint or an automotive plant footprint, you can't put a single use back onto that particular site. It can't be all housing or all commercial uses or all industrial uses. Oftentimes it takes a lot of different individual uses to fill that hole. These were large properties. These were large places. These were the hearts of some communities and it takes a lot to replace or start to replace uh, some of that physical infrastructure and some of that physical building. Um, we're also seeing besides the idea of putting multiple uses on sites, a lot of updating or adapting or retrofits of sites. We're putting renewable energy on rooftops. Large manufacturing sites tend to have very flat roofs. So those are good sites to put uh, solar or we're seeing other opportunities to uh, use existing sites to have some renewable energy or some other multifunction purpose beyond what they were originally intended to do. Uh, Dr. Ferber, uh, this is Doug. And I would uh, echo John's comments and, and you know, we, at the local level call this mixed use and it's it's a you know i think it's interchangeable with multifunctionality now it, it there is a balance to be struck i i think mixed use um has been wildly successful in more urban environments to ensure that there is multiple uh economic social and to the extent we can do it, uh, restore environmental functions, um, and whether that's through open space or you know other amenities. Now, there is, on the other hand, a a need, and I think this is part of the beauty of the area-wide planning concept, to look at large areas that may be predominantly agriculture or predominantly forest land or other types of, of more rural uh, environments that where multifunctionality may not be the approach, but it, it doesn't mean that it's inappropriate. It just means that you have to look at the existing landscape of the, the codes, the, the, the rules that apply and the, and the interests that are there. You mentioned those of the various interests like transportation and 
uh, in this, again, I'll refer back to what I'm familiar with in the state of Oregon, of the things that made our program most successful was the uh, protection of agricultural land uh, by exclusive agricultural zones, exclusive forest zones, and urban growth boundaries that encourage multifunctionality or mixed use um, were separate, but part of the same overall objective of keeping growth in an area, but and providing the economic, social, environmental benefits, but also protecting those large areas of land where different types of uses uh, historically and, and into the future needed to, to continue. So um, I, I think those that combined approach is, is really critical. One other thing I'll just note that I saw in both presentations um, was that the, the financial resources, both from the EU uh, for the Zeiss site, as well as for some of the sites uh, that John described, uh, absolutely critical, especially if they pay attention to linking some of that exportation money, some of that energy money, and some of the just basic planning funding into the overall design. Um, and, and with a mind of, you know, real results in the short term and long term. Yes. Uh, I think that in Germany, there's also such, we can see also a, a change of paradigm or how to say it to no longer divide the different land use, uh, trip, trip, uh, land use, yeah. land use in, in inner cities. And, but at first in planning, the, but in practice, there are a lot of problems because some people are used to finance and realize uh, commercial buildings or dwelling areas or, or business or whatever. And now they have to combine commercial with, with dwelling or residential areas. And so a, a lot um, of conflicts have to be solved. Maybe, mm -hmm. for example, in the binding land use plan, you have to look for if there are what about noise, what about traffic and so on. But uh, it's really a demand of the time to use uh, inner city areas to, to make uh, inner development before outer development to deal with that mixed use areas. And so in Germany, we also um, uh, update our Baunutzungsverordnung with a new category of so-called uh, um, about urban areas, that means that you can combine uh, live or can combine residential and commercial use in one area better than uh, it is able is possible before. Thank you, Inge. I will strongly support this idea of not only multifunctionality, multi-mix, also multifunctionality means differently overlapping different uses, for example, overlapping solar panels with agriculture production and in, in providing agriculture production on the soil and putting the solar panels on a higher level and using this for different uh, schemes. And we have plenty of difficulties to use different funding for agriculture and uh, schemes for energy in both sides. So this is one of the concepts of the bilateral group. We are definitely over the last three decades back on the concept of mixed use, but we will go beyond and multifunctionality will be another dimension and being more flexible. And I wonder if John, uh, maybe we could illustrate this in this type of playbooks. This was a very exciting idea looking in playbooks. Uh, how these playbooks have perceived by the by the people? Uh, should we transport also this idea to Germany? Playbooks for integrated multifunctionality for the use of brownfields. I think that the the playbook concept is is really good planning. It's the idea that local communities can uh, control their own future and have a voice in what happens locally. I think that in the in the United States, what's worked well is that the federal resources allow the local community freedom to decide what they want to do, that everyone can have that benefit. So there's, there is gonna be a plan, it will be decided locally, and it's also a good way to get into those details. Uh, you just mentioned the overlapping uh, uses. Uh, having a, uh, an area-wide plan or a playbook lets you get to that level of detail 
And most importantly, how do you implement that detail? How do you pay for it? How do you actually do it? Uh, plans are great. Uh, what I like about the playbooks is they take that next step towards implementation to figure out who is actually going to act to get that work done. And hopefully that can result in some change that we can all see on the ground. And that's the most, I think, uh, important thing to most communities is seeing that actual change. John, uh, just a question on following up on Uwe's uh, comment. Do the, how do the playbooks get developed? Do they, do, do, is that also a part of the local process? It usually is, yes. So usually it could be some federal resources that allow uh, a, a planning firm or a consulting firm to work with the community or just give the community some resources to do it on their own where they would have a series of public meetings. They would look at the sites and the infrastructure needs and talk about what they want to do. Um, it was discussed earlier about bringing in other plans that might be uh, non-committal plans, but might have a, a role in that planning. And so it's a good way to bring in different past plans and think about where that where the community is now, what needs to happen uh, to make it all work together. And the results of the playbook are followed by the government funds? Usually the, it could be both. It could be the government pays for the playbook or the, the state pays for the playbook or the local community does that initial plan. And then hopefully there are funds at the end. That's why I'm so excited about this infrastructure dollars because that money can be used to actually get work done. If roads are needed, if a bridge has to be rebuilt, then there's funding that can be accessed. I worked on a, a playbook um, in Wisconsin when the, um, an industrial town that had road needs, they had uh, different riverfront, waterfront needs with their parks. And so they were able to line up money after the plan was completed to actually go and get the funding they needed to change the community to make the plan happen. And now 10 years later, it's a different downtown because they've had that playbook and they've been doing all the items on that list and getting money to do so. Yes, it, thank you. One uh, short comment, and I'll pick up on something John just mentioned on transportation. Um, you know, t when I started the Brownfields work, it was in a transportation office, which people kind of scratch their heads about why would you start a Brownfields program in a transportation office? And it's because our philosophy was that unlike traditional transportation to get from point A to point B, which is created a lot of problems in across the world and in, in particularly in the United States in terms of uh, unused infrastructure or impacts on cities. We always took the philosophy that the purpose of transportation was to support adjacent land uses. And I think if that philosophy is, is integrated into both the funding result as well as the part of the plan, it could create a lot of, as John says, the there's there's good transportation money out there, but not to build roads through communities that people don't want, you know, and not to create more pollution problems and not to, you know, continue a bad pattern of urban planning. It has to be done with a philosophy of supporting uh, the existing or the adjacent land uses. Yes, we have a starting discussion in the chat. Uh, level, Mr. Brunke, a little bit, you're a little bit pessimistic because you say also companies mostly decide on greenfield instead of brownfields because of risk and contamination and so on. Um, what is the question, Mr. Brunke? Are you still online? Please pause. Uh, yes, I am sorry. Uh, Sorry, um, it's yeah, straight question, point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question was, because uh, it's, in my opinion, quite difficult to develop something in Germany on brownfields, because still many developers prefer greenfields than um, brownfields. And like, what could cities do um, to yeah, promote those areas and make it more attractive? Um, also, like maybe some law stuff uh, could be changed um yeah that was basically the question and kirsten you answered in the chat that's um, one good example from jena geos and from 
the Zeiss factory site? Yes, um, it, is, it is one of my answers, uh, but uh, I think that the, uh, the location in the in the middle of the city is for for many investors uh, uh, a very important indicator, and uh, for this they are increasingly accepted contaminated sites. Maybe also you are providing integrated approach, including the aspect of decontamination, uh, yes. soil management, and uh, so having safety and 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 viability and cost reduction in the treatment of the, the, the site. Yes, yes. So integrated planning is also uh, not only the planning work, the let's say theoretical discussion with with participant is a big engine and engineering infrastructural and, and financial work also. So all this aspect have to be involved in this integrated planning that not only by one side, by a multi of side of different in an area wide planning. No? Correct. And and the, the problem that the, the person raised is the historical biggest problem. What we have found to be one of the most effective ways of addressing that is to find ways through things like municipal land banking or state land bank, find a way to make the land more valuable, to attract the private investment, because at the end of the day, we saw this with the Zeiss site um, in Jena, and we see it with many of the sites that John talked about that were once owned by uh, large companies uh, with a lot of private investment. They have to be convinced that there is economic gain and that economic gain can somehow be enhanced by the fact that it is a brownfield as opposed to a greenfield. So the tools have to come out, uh, and there, there are a variety of tools, but uh, but they they do cross between local regulation, state regulation, and and finance. Um, and uh, setting these things aside, I, I mean, part of the part of the issue is simply identifying them as resource areas. And it goes back in part to some of the, our position paper with connecting the ecological functions of these areas, whether they're, they're seriously impacted now and can be restored or whether they still exist with the social and the economic and the environmental functions of these areas. That's something in planning that we really haven't done that much in the past and um, but again, it has to find a way to create value to the people that want to buy and develop the property. Yes, thank you very much. So Nova Plaza, which is one of the biggest supporters of our bilateral work from California, is uh, speaking in the uh, chat that we should not uh, forget the local qualification, local workforce. Nova, could you explain this statement, please, shortly? Certainly happy to, Uwe. Um, mostly it was thinking about the excitement, both about the, the Zeiss um, redevelopment, as well as the work that John was talking about with the playbook and um, communities re-envisioning themselves and the need either the opportunity for local, for increased jobs in those communities and possibly the need for new training of the workforce to to take on the work um, of rebuilding and reimagining the communities as they want to become. So was wondering if the speakers could talk a little bit about workforce development and jobs um, in this context. Thank you. I can start. Thank you for the question, Nova. You make a good point and I wish I had a good answer for you that there was a lot of integration of jobs and land use in these playbooks. These playbooks have primarily been focused on the land use, on the infrastructure needs, uh, transportation, housing, parks, uh, environmental remediation needs, and they have not spoken much to the workforce needs or to the long-term job needs. What has happened is sometimes you have a separate plan that's focused on the workforce transition and that workforce transition could be uh, an immediate workforce transition that might be needed for immediate retraining of people in uh, an automotive facility or in a power plant, 
or it could be a long term workforce transition, knowing that the community over the longer term needs to um, have retraining, have uh, different education opportunities, and so it could be a different type of workshop workforce training approach. But generally, I've seen that they tend to be separate conversations, separate plans, separate uh, groups of individuals talking about what is needed, and there really hasn't been that overlap um, in many places yet. But I do appreciate your point that it should happen, um, and it'd be nice to see this take take place in the future. Perhaps a question to the Turingian colleagues. Uh, it's the integrated approach creates jobs, yes, and the, the energy supply and, and services and so on. Ingo, maybe? Or oh, Kirsten? It's more a question to Kirsten. <laughs> what about <laughs> food, for example? What do you think? Um, what? Hmm? Uh, from my point of view, I can't, uh, I can't answer these questions because I'm not dealing with the, uh, the following processes of live and work in such areas we, we make integrated uh, concepts for. But uh, I think it's more a question of using, for example, reusable energies and, and connect the uh, although you see, um, how to say, it, the synergy effects between uh, contamination and 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 uh, direct new buildings. But Kirsten, do you understand the question? Is uh, are you able to? Please help me. Please help me, Ingo. <laughs> no, perhaps Kirsten, because we have three months, three minutes times uh, left. Um, the uh, question is. How do we integrate workforces? But this is clearly the case in German coal mining areas, also in Brownfield says in Zeiss Jena, that uh, it's a question of qualification and a big opportunity to save jobs, to create new jobs, to be autonomous in, in all kinds of uh, sense. But secondly, also we are discussing in Germany very intensively to create cooperatives for renewable energies on brownfields to participate local people in energy communities, so-called energy community concept of the European Commission, uh, to allow people to participate financially also in this transformation, because it's a big opportunity and a big challenge because the financial implication in this transformation process also allows to go to the political discussion about the uh, discussions that what is the future of some regions and uh, what is the future of the sites and the region in itself. Um, we have any more chat questions and before giving the final words to Doug, I need perhaps two minutes time to invite you to the next topic of our webinar series of uh, Brownfield area wide planning. Uh, we will have in May the next webinar on the question how to deal with data. We could not avoid data because we need data. And on the other hand, sometimes we have too much data and the concept is on the next webinar to discuss a realistic and efficient way to deal with data, to use data for the integrated area-wide planning. The third seminar will be followed by community engagement because as discussed today in some uh, points, the community engagement is crucial also for the success for the transformation of uh, brownfields uh, and, and uh, transformation areas. So this will be the case in the June uh, webinar. Uh, we have to discuss money because also in the next webinar we have funding programs and uh, sometimes it's probably a question to have too much money, to less money money not good allocated and so the bilateral working group of Germany and US, we have some idea how to allocate efficiently money and state funds and public money to the transformation of brownfield. And last but not least, we go in this question how to organize this structure. Should we have the integrated agencies or organizations which are supporting people in the transformation? And so in all, we have uh, four other webinars in the next uh, three months, four months before our uh, perspective to the, have a common paper on the idea how to promote area-wide planning. So I give the word back to the final.
the words for the webinar, first webinar of the Bilateral Working Group. It's been an honor and a privilege to help kick off this effort. And it's wonderful to see old friends and make new ones. And the effort that, as you indicated, and we just started 30 years ago with the US German bilateral, now transitioning into DEUS and using new platforms, new technology, I think is going to expand this conversation. Um, and I really look forward to it, but I want to thank all the hard work that everybody is doing on the US and the German side and uh, look forward to, to looking at opportunities throughout the European Union and throughout uh, the rest of, of all the communities in the country, uh, in the world that we can help uh, spread this message. One last thought, you know, we've talked about the need for community involvement for communication and, and we, we ended on a note about workforce. In my experience, I've spent about two thirds of my career in the private sector and about a third in the public sector. And one thing I have learned, if you want to get money from private investors, you need to get them at the table and talk to them and ask them, what do they need? What do they need not only from a piece of land, but from government, from tax incentives, what is it that helps them employ people, get them into new technology, new training, or traditional small business, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the investment is, make sure that they are at the table and people are talking to them. And sometimes we, we overlook that because um, they tend to occupy more of the legal framework than the actual physical residents of the community and they're they're part of the fabric we need to get them at the table and tell us what can you do to help support a new workforce in these new areas so i'll leave that thought i look forward to the future of our endeavor and um god bless ukraine